Marissa with Alliance for a Better Minnesota. Thanks for tuning in to our live stream with State Representative Melissa Hortman. She's the Minnesota House Minority, le minority Leader. So thanks so much for joining us on Facebook Live today. My pleasure. I'm really glad you guys set up all the technology because this is challenging for me. So thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, so how about we just start with a little introduction for everybody. Sounds good. Well, my name is Melissa Hortman. I'm the minority leader in the Minnesota House of Representatives. That means I'm the leader of the DFLers. We're in the minority. The Republicans are in the majority. And I represent State District, uh, State House District 36B. It's Brooklyn Park and Coon Rapids, both sides of the Mississippi River. So I like to think of myself as a state representative for a little part of the Mississippi River. And my son Colin is out in California. My daughter Sophie is in Colorado. And my husband Mark is at work. So hopefully Sophie and Colin will catch this, but probably not Mark. Awesome. Hi, Sophie and Colin. I hope you're both watching. Um, so let's just jump right in because we got some really awesome questions, a ton of good questions from everybody in our audience, right. and I want to try and get to as many as we can while we're here right now. But first, I want to learn and kind of share with everybody a little bit more about you as a person before we get into the more serious questions about the, the legislature and the session. Um, so what is your favorite thing about Minnesota? Snow. This week, it's not popular for me to say that I like snow, but uh, my very favorite thing of anything to do is skiable snow. So I know we're that we are in. <laughs> I don't know. Just as much as I'm a fan of third breakfast, I guess I am a fan of third winter. <laughs> Good. Third breakfast is, is a great thing. Um, what would you say is the most Minnesotan thing about you? Oh boy, probably that, that I have no hobbies other than snow related activities. Um, I'm mostly pretty nice. I guess that's a Minnesota thing. Minnesota nice. That's good. That's a good thing to be. Um, so let's, let's talk about the session, the legislative session. We're, now we have about six weeks left mm -hmm. for this year's session. Um, and people had a lot of questions about some important policy related things that you all are working on that is also stuff that's happening nationally, especially gun violence and gun violence prevention was, we probably got the most questions from our audience on the, that Makes particular sense. issue. And you know, everyone's talking about it. Everyone wants something to be done about it. Um, so some of, the, some of the ways that people were kind of asking, we're in a broader sense of, how how do you think that the the house and that just kind of our representatives at the capitol in general can best address the issue of gun violence in minnesota well i like to tell people we are a responsive institution at the minnesota house of representatives so we reflect back the work that minnesotans put on our In the Thursday of that week, more thousands We thought given what had happened in Parkland on Valentine's Day, it was And can you talk about kind of what, so there's a couple of the, like those pieces of legislation that are really And then there's some, you know, more kind of extreme um, proposals out there. But when you really look at what's common sense, supported by the vast majority of people, responsible gun owners, you know, even members of the NRA who think that there's some reasonable regulation to keep the to keep guns out of dangerous people at dangerous times in their lives, they're really the two that make the most sense are criminal background checks and gun violence prevention orders. Because you know, like that kid down in Florida who, um, you know, we could now say terrorist, who, who killed all those people, um, he had 
issued red flags. You know, law enforcement knew there was something going on, but they didn't have any tool where they could go in and take the guns out of his hands for even a limited period of time. So we clearly need something like that. So what would you say are the biggest barriers to implementing some of these reforms in Minnesota right now? Well, we've gotten every indication that the Republican leadership of the House and the Senate aren't going to let anything happen. So right now, uh, the Republicans are in control of the Minnesota House and the Minnesota Senate. And we had kind of a knockdown drag out on this um, where we pushed and we said, look, Minnesotans want us to do something. These bills should move forward through the legislative process. And uh, Republicans moved to table the measures. And with 100 percent Republican votes for tabling the measures, they have killed them for the session. Okay, so what, I think for our audience especially, what, what can people be doing to, if, if, if something can't happen in this session, what can people be doing to be pushing, pushing for something to happen maybe in the next session or, you know, you, there's been all these huge um, rallies and protests and people are clearly showing that they want something to be done what more can they be doing that's directly talking to you all and voicing their opinions on this? Right, and I suppose it's pretty important for me to distinguish when I say dead for the session, those bills can't travel alone as legislative proposals, but we still have the process of many bills going through the House floor. And so what we can do when other bills are on the House floor is we can offer those as amendments and we can offer other provisions as amendments. So the fight is definitely not over. We're going to bring the fight to the Republicans every, every day that we can, every day that there's a relevant bill on the House floor. So it still matters if people weigh in with their state representatives and their state senators to let them know they support legislation like this so that their representatives feel more like voting in favor of our amendments when we put them up on the floor. Um, the other thing that people can do is really get involved in um, backing candidates who run for office who agree with their principles. I mean, on certain issues you might not agree with your state representative, but where you feel that your state representative is kind of letting you down or letting the population down, you know, that sometimes motivates people to get involved in campaigns and elections. Sure, great. And just so folks know, uh, you can also sign up. We pinned to the top of our comments a sign up link to our list for Alliance for a Better Minnesota. You can sign up there and we'll be keeping people aware of what's going on with these really important issues and we're going to be following this stuff throughout the session and, and ongoing as well. And we'll be sharing some links to ways that you can get involved in other groups like petitions and volunteering and, and actions that groups are planning around these types of issues too. So make sure that you look out in the comments for all of that stuff. Um, and what about maybe, you know, if, if someone's wanting to do something more kind of at the local level, um, not necessarily in St. Paul at the Capitol, is there maybe some kind of ways or actions that people can be taking around this issue within their specific communities? Sure, I think it really makes a difference in the public debate when people have conversations with their friends and neighbors about it, when they post on social media and they share their point of view, um, sending letters to the editor of the local paper and to the, you know, the major Twin Cities papers, and then getting together with other people who are like-minded. That's empowering, that's really how action gets done. At the state capitol, you know how I said we're a responsive institution. The people who have the most impact with us are those who join hands with others and come in an organized group to advocate for change. So we have Moms Demand Action, we have um, Protect Minnesota, and there's other groups doing this work. So joining in and being part of those efforts is a way to really empower your voice. Great, yeah. The more people joining in and raising their voices, the better, absolutely. Um, so that was a big one. You know, A lot of people are thinking and talking mm -hmm. about gun violence prevention. It's a very big issue. Some other questions we got were around um, kind of the like hashtag Me Too movement and around sexual harassment, sexual assault. Um, you know, there was an issue last year that a couple of folks who asked, asked questions brought up where there were um, some men in the legislature during session that were ignoring the voices of women on the House floor that you explicitly called them out for ignoring women, women of color. Um, there were a few folks who want, thanked you for that, for standing up for women and for making sure that w women are being heard when they're speaking. Um, so wh has, what has changed for the better since you called your colleagues out that day and since kind of, that was about a, a year ago. So what, what change, like more positive and progressive changes have been made? Well, I think more women are raising their voices, and I don't think it has that much to do with me standing up on you know, April 4th, 2017, but I think the election where Donald Trump won and Hillary Clinton lost for a lot of women 
was a moment of awakening. Um, <clears throat> watching the way that she was covered in the media versus the way he was covered in the media. And then um, I think the women's marches were in a way of kind of, oh, hell no, we're not going to just take this lying down. Like we're, we're out here and we're kind of in a way saying, we disagree with what you stand for. We disagree with that it's okay to sexually assault women and treat women like they're less just because you're a powerful man and you think you're all that. So I think ever since the Donald Trump election, women have been standing up and saying, I'm not going to take it anymore in different ways. And I just happened to do that with a microphone on the House floor on April 3rd. You know, we had been having problems in the Minnesota House. We had gone to the speaker time and time again. I had gone to the speaker about four different times to talk to him about men totally ignoring women on the House floor. Early in the session, Lori Halverson stood up to give a speech. The men in the back row were talking so loud, she couldn't even hear herself talk. And so I went to the speaker and I said, you've got to control that. Everybody deserves respect on the House floor. We had a bunch of young women come to me. Um, a lot of our new freshmen are young women. And they said, look, in committee, we're raising our hand and asking the chair call on me and offering input. And either we're being ignored when we raise our hand or when we give our input, the chair says something like, oh, honey, if you only understood, you wouldn't have that objection to the bill. And I brought that to the speaker and said, you know, you can't disrespect these young women. They have every right to contribute just as any other representative. And then the fourth thing was uh, Representative Susan Allen was recognizing James Baldwin during Black History Month. We always do a tribute on the House floor during Black History Month to significant figures throughout history. And um, the floor was so loud you couldn't hear Susan Allen. And so um, Representative Aaron Murphy walked up to the Speaker's rostrum and said, Mr. Speaker, will you please quiet the House chamber? And he said, no. If she were saying something important or she were doing it in a compelling way, I wouldn't have to. So when we got to the April 3rd uh, dudes playing cards, watching the Twins home opener last year, totally ignoring a debate where women of color were talking about the value of protest in society and that, you know, some of us have to assert our rights. They're just not automatically recognized. And it just, t for them to be ignoring women during that debate was like, that was when I got to my oh hell no moment. I'm just not taking this anymore. Um, but I think m many women in many ways have been doing that ever since Donald Trump got elected. And the Me Too conversation is is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So um, you've introduced your own bill to address issues like these of sexual harassment and respecting women. There's been some other ones um, and folks are aware and have questions about have there been improvements or is there movement on like mandatory sexual harassment training that has been proposed to happen in the legislature um is, can you talk about where any of that stuff is going or sure. kind of explains what, what some of that is that legislatively in, in the form of various bills that you're working on to address right. these issues <laughs> Well, four brave women raised their voices in the fall. Uh, Representative Aaron May Quaid, Lindsey Port, Representative Jamie Becker Finn, Representative Lori Halverson came forward in the fall and told stories in the media and ha had the courage to come forward and talk about um, the issue of sexual harassment. And um, what they proposed at that time was that we form a task force and we get outside human resources professionals, employment law professionals, to advise the legislature on how can we make sure that every single person who comes to the state capitol can be free from sexual harassment. And what these women proposed was a brilliant task force. The job that they proposed that we give the task force was really smart. How can we improve things for staff and members? How can we improve things for lobbyists? and um, constituents and members of the media so that they're not harassed when they come to the state capitol. Um, and I have had really um, an impossible time trying to convince Republican leader Kurt Dowd and Republican leader Paul Gazelka to appoint the task force. So I thought that they would informally agree to it and I per tried to persuade them, um, you know, behind closed doors before we started session. But when they were increasingly resistant and you know unwilling to do it I put in a bill so that bill unfortunately isn't going to move because the speaker doesn't want um, any outsiders judging members and I really think we can't get uh, to moving forward on this issue until we have outsiders judging members we clearly have not done such a hot job of policing ourselves or we wouldn't have had to have a resignation of a Minnesota state senator in the fall and the resignation of a Minnesota state representative so it's time for us to open the doors and let some outside observers in and say, how can we make it better? And you know, Representative Jamie Becker Finn has finally decided she's not waiting anymore. She's forming the work group. She's mm -hmm. just going to do that work, and we're going to move forward on that. 
uh, with or without the Republicans, and it looks like without the Republicans, unfortunately, because this really isn't a partisan issue. You know, this is really, and it's not necessarily just a women's issue. Anybody can be sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of another question that people had on that issue mm -hmm. as well is, so what can people be doing then that are watching this kind of from the outside and wanting to be, wanting to see action happening? How can women and, and folks as well that are just kind of generally concerned about these issues happening within the legislature and just in workplaces and just to women all over the place because we know that this happens. Mm -hmm. um, what can people be doing to kind of be putting that pressure on and you know trying to help move these things forward so that there is action? Well I think we all have to be more vocal in our personal spaces. I think it's very hard to challenge when you see somebody engaging in conduct that is um, boorish and rude and immature to say like knock it out uh, that's not that's not uh, funny I don't I don't think that you should use language like that or, or um, make comments like that in the workplace so I think in our personal spaces that's that's really a challenge for all of us to raise our voices and then with regard to being a citizen I think sometimes people think that it doesn't make any difference if you send an email to your state representative um, it absolutely makes a difference. We are just like every other American that we're looking at our cell phone constantly and like what's new, what's new. And so we see those emails right away. You know, when you call our office, our legislative assistant answers the phone. So really the best way to reach representatives where they're sitting, no matter where they are, is to shoot them an email. And if representatives were hearing more from people, you know, Me Too was so powerful on social media this fall, right? with all these stories on Facebook, if some of that communication were directed at state representatives and state senators in particular to say, hey, hashtag me too, I, now I want you to do something about it, that could be really powerful. Awesome, thank you. And another, a couple other questions that we had kind of around, uh, relating to women, women's types of issues um, around kind of reproductive health care, reproductive rights for women. Um, so how, how can you, have you worked or, can you and others in the legislature continue to work to make sure that women are having, you know, guaranteed access to reprodu good reproductive health care and um, and also like safe and accurate reproductive education for women as well, so that you know women are and just people in general are being educated about reproductive health care and then also having access to those resources. Well, obviously, we need comprehensive sex education in all of our schools. That's a super critical part. But then Planned Parenthood and clinics like that serve such an important role in our communities, whether it's high school girls going to get co contraception, college young women, or young men getting STD checks and figuring out what they can do to prevent spreading STDs. Um, so we have a significant move in the Minnesota legislature by Republicans to defund Planned Parenthood, which if they really care about reducing unintended pregnancies is about the stupidest thing they could possibly do. Because that's what Planned Parenthood is in the business of doing, is preventing unwanted pregnancies and letting women plan their economic lives and their family lives at a time and a pace that works for them. Um, so I think we're at a time where a lot of people have become active on this issue since the election too. I know my daughter Sophie said that on her college campus right after the election you could not get into the clinic for birth control because everybody was so concerned that there wasn't going to be the opportunity to have that in the future. People were stocking up and you know getting um, long-term birth control before Barack Obama's term of the presidency ended. So what, what young people can do, what people who care about this issue can do is, again, join with like-minded people. So whether it's Planned Parenthood, whether it's NARAL, um, whether it's a candidate who uh, shares their views to be involved with that person, you know, joining together with like-minded people and also sending an email to your state representative. Again, I mean, it sounds kind of like not that meaningful of an activity, but this is democracy today, is you shoot an email to your state representative and let them know how you feel, even if you think they agree with you. For me to go on the House floor and say like 90% of my contacts are pro-choice and 10% are pro-life is really very valuable um, so that I'm reflecting what, what I'm hearing from constituents. So even when you know where your state representative stands, super important to weigh in, mm -hmm. to have your voice heard. 
How about on social media? Everyone's pretty active on Facebook and Twitter. Is that another way that people can be reaching you and their representatives? Or Yes. I mean, I think there are limits, right? I don't know how other people feel about being tweeted at, but um, when somebody like you know tweets at me, it's not necessarily um, always the most comfortable way to be reached. Uh, like direct messages with questions are nicer, to be honest. But um, I th in Facebook messages, I have a, a political Facebook, and then I have my official state representative Facebook. But for people to interact with us that way, you know, when we get like t tagged and stuff, that can be a little awkward because it's not really starting a conversation. So if somebody really wants to talk to me about an issue, they want to weigh in and say, I would like you to do something, or I would like you to not do something. The best way is to send a message saying, Dear Representative Hortman, please X Y Z rather than like maybe tweeting about me or Facebooking about me because I might actually agree with them. I, want, I might want to join forces with them and work with them. So I think um, for the most part for me, social media so far has been kind and polite, but I'm nervous that it definitely has the potential to um, be a little oppressive and in people's face, which of course I want for the people I don't agree with, but I don't necessarily want it for me. But that's, you know, it's a tool. It is a tool that people can use and it's another way to raise their voice. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and it's important for people to know how to reach you directly, too, I think, because people will want to know that as well. Um, so kind of pivoting over to a different question that we got, uh, some about technology and data collection is a big part of our lives, as we know. Right. It's, that's also something that's been very huge in the news with Facebook and in the media. Um, so there's some, you know, people are kind of getting concerned about their privacy and kind of like the ethics around the technology and collecting data. So what can be done at a state level to protect people online? We have some good um, protections for the data that the government um, collects. But you know, uh, State Representative Paul Thiessen and State Senator Ron Latz have been working really hard to protect people's privacy on the internet. They have a bill um, that Ron has introduced in the Senate and Paul has introduced in the House really good measures on internet privacy and protecting people's data. I think all of us have like mixed uh, feelings about this, right? You want to be on Facebook and on Twitter and, and use these powerful social media tools. On the other hand, you don't want your data to be exploited. And so um, these, these tools are double-edged swords. They let us unite together and be very powerful together. But they also do make us a little bit vulnerable for people who want to use them for the wrong reason. So I think right now is a time where the government should be paying particular attention to this public policy area, so whether it's the city councils or the state legislatures or the federal government, we need to be dedicating a lot of time um, to this public policy discussion. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and so people should, if they're interested in this issue, take a look at what Paul Thiessen and Ron Latz are doing. The great thing about the Minnesota legislature with 201 people there is there's, there's a genius on almost every topic. There's an idiot on almost every topic also, <laughs> but uh, Paul Thiessen and Ron Latz are doing great work in this area. Excellent. Um, so another question that we got is around uh, businesses. Are there any initiatives or kind of ways that DFLers and or just the legislature in general is working to help small minority owned businesses or small business owners? Yep, absolutely. Um, wh whether the Democrats have been in control or not, but especially when we've been in control, we have used the Minnesota Department of uh, Employment and Economic Development to help give special assistance to uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses to get up and get rolling. So there's a lot of programs if people are interested in um, that topic to go to the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. We shorthand it, we call it DEED. Um, if you Google that, um, people will be able to find a variety of things that exist out there. And, and that's another, yet another example of when you join together with other people, you're more powerful because there's some really great um, minority chambers of commerce, so Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and um, uh, Hmong folks are really well um, connected through their business community. So lots of different ways for people to connect with each other and to connect with us. Okay, awesome. Um, we got some questions as well about teachers and um, we all know that teachers you know, tend to struggle and um, especially in the wages that they're earning. So there's been, there were a few questions around teachers are not making enough to exist kind of working in that chosen right. profession alone um, right. as they you know as they should be um, so what what is being done kind of 
in the legislature right now to address le that type of issue of teachers being you know, paid and treated fairly or what is something that can be done? Yeah, this is an area where you can really see the different approaches of the two political parties. So Republicans um, look at the teacher shortage and they say, well, we need to lo lower standards and basically let anybody come into a classroom and teach our children. And Democrats say, there's actually not a teacher shortage. There are enough licensed teachers in the state of Minnesota, but so many teachers who are licensed and qualified to be in classrooms have chosen not to currently be teaching um, to their licensure. And the reason is the pay is crappy and the hours are long and the respect that they're getting from public officials in some cases and from the public is not adequate um, to, the, to the amount of work that they're doing. And there's, we, we keep heaping more and more expectation, expectations on our teachers. So we have um, really record low school counselors in Minnesota schools, so we're asking our classroom teachers to be the counselors as well as the teachers. And teachers want to teach. Um, so what DFLers, we look at and we say they're not, getting made, they're not getting enough money and we need to raise their pay. The other thing that DFLers look at is we say that that money needs to come from the state of Minnesota rather than local levies so that every teacher in every part of the state can get a competitive salary and they don't just have to live in a super rich suburb that finds it easy to pass levies in order to get enough money to pay their teachers. So what we're consistently fighting for and have been fighting for is to get more money dedicated to education and um, to help the teacher salaries be stable and increasing. And this is something that you know Minnesotans brought to us. We went out um, last year, we did this project called Minnesota Voter or Values Project, mm -hmm. and we went out, kind of put a blank slate in front of Minnesotans and said, what's important to you? Time and time again, they said, we want excellent education for our children. We want more investment in education for our children. Yeah. Of course. I mean, who doesn't want to have a great education? And it's kind of a tried and true issue. I think people, you know, sometimes we like the new, interesting, sexy issues like, you know, sexual harassment, opioids, minlars this year. But year in and year out, what matters to a lot of people is that high quality education. And in Minnesota, we used to be so known mm -hmm. for being fantastic in education. We've just slipped and we've got to um, redouble our efforts to get our ranking back up there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so we are just about out of time. I've gotten quite a few questions. Uh, not a serious question. Are you a fan of Harry Potter or do you follow Harry Huge Potter? Fan. Huge fan. Huge fan. Good. When my kids were little, the books were coming out. We would stay up until midnight and go to Barnes and Noble. And um, yeah, my son would wear his Harry Potter robe and the little glasses. He looked like Harry. We had that, <laughs> the Minnesota Gopher scarf that looks like the Hogwarts or the uh, Gryffindor. Um, scarf, and then my daughter was spit an image of Hermione Granger when she was little. So awesome! Yeah. So people are dying to know, and I've gotten multiple questions on this even just now. Which Hogwarts house are you in? Well, Gryffindor, right? <laughs> of course. I mean, that I was my guess. That yes, was my guess. Yes. Just a brief explanation. Why? What's? Why is that your chosen one? Well, I sort of feel like you know we're the good guys doing battles with the forces of evil. So as the leader of the DFL in the Minnesota House, it just seems like a natural fit. Perfect. Uh, you know, to my mind, um, some Republicans would fit very well in Slytherin. <laughs> I'm sure we could like go and individually sort the whole legislature, <laughs> but that's for another day because we're we, out of time. Yeah, we should ask my daughter why she thinks she's in Slytherin. That's I still need to know the answer <laughs> to that question. Okay, well, if you're watching, you can you can answer that later on today. Um, but we are out of time. We're up. Thanks everybody though so much for joining with us. Thank you, Representative. We really appreciate it, and Thanks. we'll see you guys next time. It was fun. Thank.